Today we continue in the season of Lent. It's the second Sunday in Lent, and this year we're doing something a little bit different with this season than we typically do. We are focusing on stories that are from the scriptures that point to the days after the resurrection. Um, That may seem unusual on the one hand, but on the other hand, we remember that in the Christian tradition, every Sunday is intended to be a little Easter. Uh, St. Augustine used the language of Sundays being the sacrament of Easter. And so it is a time for us to remember with joy and celebration that even as we are in Lent, we are aware of the risen Christ in our presence and in our midst and give thanks for that. So this morning, we'll turn our attention to an encounter that Jesus has with Peter Uh, Peter is one of the disciples that is talked about in the Gospels and in other places in the New Testament. In fact, he is the most referenced disciple of all of them in the New Testament. So an important figure in Jesus' ministry with his 12 and also in the formation of the early church. And I'm going to read for us just a small portion of a longer section from the 21st chapter of John, um, and I invite you to listen to these words as I share them. When they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. He asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad that Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. This is the word of God for the people of God. And God's people say, thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Come Holy Spirit and breathe life into the words that I speak that they might carry a word from you into our hearts and lives on this day. Amen. How do you come back from your worst moment? How do you recover from your greatest failure? Some never do, you know. Some cannot get away from the cycle that repeats inside the mind of those actions, those words, that thing, that event that seems to continue to define who they are. Sometimes other people contribute to the matter by also reminding them of that thing that they did or that thing that they said. And so the mind plays this tape over and over again uh, of what feels like is just so overwhelming that everything else lives in the shadow of that worst moment. For Peter, it was the night when Jesus was arrested. They had shared the meal together in the upper room with the other disciples. Peter was one of the ones who had gone out to the garden with Jesus when he took the time to pray knowing what was coming. And then Jesus was arrested there in the garden, and as he was led away by the soldiers, Peter's whole world was crumbling. What could possibly be happening? This was not the way things were supposed to turn out. He follows at a little bit of a distance, wanting to keep an eye on what's going to happen, but also afraid, fear clings to him in those moments. Confusion hangs like a thick fog on his mind and his thoughts because this is not the way it's supposed to be. 
it is the middle of a night, and it is dark, and it is cold, and Peter finds a spot not too far away from where he thinks they are interrogating Jesus, where there's a charcoal fire, and there's some others standing there, and so he walks up to it to try to get a little bit of warmth, maybe to clear his head from all that he's thinking and feeling. When somebody else standing there at the fire notices him and says, aren't you one of his disciples? Oh, me? No, 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 not me. A few minutes go by. A second person sees him. You're one of his followers, aren't you? No, 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 not me. And then once more, somebody sees him, recognizes him, and says, you were with him in the garden this earlier this evening, weren't you? No, you've got the wrong guy. It was not me. I don't know what you're talking about. And in those moments, Peter, the one who had been one of Jesus' closest companions, the one who Jesus had said would be the rock who would help build Christ's church has denied his master not one time, not two times, but three times. How do you come back from that? The last chapter of the Gospel of John, chapter 21, begins with John telling us about a decision that Peter makes in the aftermath of all that has happened in the days of Jesus' passion and crucifixion and resurrection. Peter apparently one day decides that he needs to return to what feels familiar. And so he says to the other disciples, I'm going to go fishing, guys. And some of them, John tells us, go with him. And so off they go. And John tells us that they fished all night long, doing what they knew quite well. After all, remember that before Peter ever met Jesus, fishing is what he did. This was his vocation, something that he presumably was good at. And yet on this night... As it gets closer to dawn, things have not gone well. In fact, the gospel tells us that they have caught nothing, zero fish. And Peter must be thinking in that moment, have I really forgotten this much about fishing in three years after being with Jesus for this time? And then suddenly, it's just about daybreak. And Jesus, the risen Christ, appears in the distance on the shoreline. They don't know it's him. They don't recognize him in that moment. It will take a little bit for them to realize this. But he sees them out there in the boat. He knows what is happening. And he calls out to them, are you having some trouble, fellas? Why, yes, as a matter of fact, we are. And so he offers a suggestion, why don't you take that net and throw it on the other side of the boat? Now, now remember, they don't yet know who this stranger is that's standing on the shoreline, according to John. And, and they're fishermen. This is what they do. And so some stranger telling them how to do their job seems a little um, interesting. But it's been a rough night. So... What is there to lose? So they do exactly as he said. They take the net, they throw it on the other side, and no sooner has the net dropped into the water than suddenly it is overflowing with fish. It's at that moment that the recognition comes, at least for the disciple John, who says, it is the Lord. And as soon as he hears those words, Peter cannot contain his enthusiasm, his excitement, the one who is always the quick start, right? 
And so he jumps out of the boat, and then John tells us this quirky little detail that before he starts to run to shore, he recognizes his nakedness, and so he covers himself up with a coat and then starts to run to shore. Maybe that's just a little quirky piece that John includes, or maybe John is pointing us back to another story about nakedness in the garden and Adam and Eve needing to cover themselves up in their shame. Whatever the reason, Peter covers himself up and then runs to shore to meet up with Jesus. And having been exuberant in the initial moment, as he's running, perhaps that exuberance is mingled with some fear and trepidation as now he begins to reflect on what has happened in his not-so-distant past. But nevertheless, he comes up on shore, and the story tells us that the other disciples bring the boat in, and when they get there, they see that Jesus has already prepared a charcoal fire, and he has brought some fish of his own, and he invites them now to add some of their fish to the fish that he has prepared And they will have breakfast together, a reunion meal on the beach, if you will. They enjoy this time together, and as the meal draws toward a close, Jesus motions to Peter. And they step away from the others who are gathered there in order to be able to have a conversation that is just for the two of them. I imagine Jesus putting his arm around Peter, walking a little ways away from the group. And then he says, Peter, do you love me? And he asked that question not one time, not two times. He asked the question, Three times. And with each ask, he is helping Peter untangle himself from the guilt that has been weighing him down for the three times that he had denied Jesus just days before. With each ask, he is reminding Peter who he is and what Jesus saw in him before his worst moment That he is someone who Jesus trusted to be a disciple. And that now, in spite of his worst moment, he is inviting him to pick up that work again. Do you love me, Peter? Then feed my sheep. You know, as I was spending time with this story again this week, It made me wonder what Jesus has to say to us here about the cancel culture that exists in our world today. You all familiar with cancel culture? Where when somebody says something or does something that feels hurtful or harmful to you or is something that's so far away from what you think is right and good uh, that you just, you cancel them. Want nothing to do with them anymore. You throw them on the trash heap. This happens in personal relationships, it happens in the media, it happens all around us, and and the term that gets used for it these days is cancel culture. It's not what we hear in this story today, though, is it? Jesus doesn't cancel people. Jesus, the risen Christ, does not bury people under a weight of shame because of their worst moments. So perhaps neither should we. Eddie James and Tommy Woodard, uh, who are better known as the skit guys, have an uncanny ability to bring Scripture to light in some meaningful and compelling ways through their storytelling uh, drama. One of the ones they've done that for is this story, this encounter between Jesus and Peter. 
So I want to invite you to take just the next couple of moments and watch them tell the story. Take a look. Grace is God's unmerited favor for us, his crazy love. And the truth is, many times we struggle understanding it. If you find yourself struggling to understand God's grace, don't beat yourself up. Even the disciples struggled with understanding grace. Jesus, is that you? You're alive. I can't believe you're alive. Okay, I was in the boat and I wasn't catching any fish, okay? But I heard this voice and the voice said, cast your net to the other side. And so I'm thinking, I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing, but I'm not catching any fish, you know? And so I throw that net over there and then a gaggle of fish pop into that net and I'm going, this is a total miracle. Who could have done that? I need to know who told me to throw the net to the other side. And boom, I look up and I mean, there is you. You're looking at me on the seashore going, it is I, the Lord, and you're alive. I can't believe you're alive. This is awesome. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on. Peter, it, yeah. do you love me? Yes, I love you. I love you. You're alive. This is so great. Good, and, then feed my sheep. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on, man. It's him. Peter, yeah. do you love me? I love you, yes. And I'm so sorry about that rooster cluck, and I had no idea what that meant, but I do not. I'm better for it, all right? Okay. Then feed my sheep. Andrew, I'm smiling, but I'm serious. Come on, get out of the boat. It's him. Peter, yeah. do you love me? Jesus, mere words cannot describe the passion that I have for you. I love you. You know everything. I love you. Good. Good. Then feed my sheep. I didn't even know you had livestock. That is so like you, though. There's something new about you all the time. That's what I love about you. Peter, yeah. do you remember uh, the morning the ladies went to the tomb? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all in the upper room trying to figure out what to do next, you know, because we thought you were dead. You know, you were dead, you know, and we're trying to figure all that out, you know. And Mary comes running up, and Mary's like saying, beehive, beehive, beehive. And I'm thinking, I'm allergic to bees. Like, keep them out. You know what I'm saying? But as she kept getting closer, I heard her correctly. She was saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we're going, who's alive, who's alive? And she said, she was at the tomb, and the tomb was empty. And she said that the, there was an angel there. And the angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. And so me and John, we hightail it down there. And if John says he beat me, he's totally lying, all right? I beat him, FYI, all right, you know? And we get down there, and I'm looking at that tomb, and it is. It is empty. There's nothing in there, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And John is right there. John is so good with words. He should write a book. He is so good with words. And John said, don't you get it, Peter? This is everything Jesus said he was going to do, and you did it, and it's done. Let's go. This is so great. Wait, yeah. the angel said what? Uh, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. You've risen. Let's go. This he is said what? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. You said my name. Why did you say my name? Peter, that's grace. No, no, I don't, I don't deserve that because that night people kept coming up to me asking me if I belonged to you, if I was with you, and I kept denying you left and right, all right? No, no it'll take me my whole life to make up for what I did. It was unforgivable no, for what I did. No, What I did on the cross was meant to take what is unforgivable and make it forgivable. That's my grace. It's not about you. It's always about me. That's grace, Peter. Yeah. Go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. This is the way the end of the Gospel of Mark captures Jesus' words to the women who, as we said in our affirmation of faith this morning, were the first that he appeared to. He tells them to go and tell the disciples and Peter, not because he was excluding Peter as not being a disciple in that moment, but because he wanted to make sure that Peter, in the wake of his worst moment, heard the good news. One version of this passage at the end of Mark translates it this way, go tell the disciples especially Peter, because Peter especially needed to know it. The risen Christ comes to meet us where we are and to raise us up to become the very best versions of ourselves. 
So you might wonder, did this encounter with Jesus matter for Peter? Did it make a difference? You bet your fish breakfast it did. When we look at the rest of the New Testament, there is no question that the trajectory of Peter's life has changed forever after that moment. When we get to the beginning of the book of Acts, And we arrive at that point of the story where the church is born. Pentecost Sunday, Peter is the one who stands up before the large crowd that is gathered and is wondering what in the world is going on with these people talking in different languages. It is Peter who stands up to tell them what is going on. It is Peter who announces the good news of God's love for them and delivers the first sermon of the newly formed church. And then throughout the book of Acts, we see Peter walking in Christ's footsteps, preaching and teaching and healing, and we see him living courageously, and others take notice. Listen to this verse from Acts 4, verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, the boldness, the one who was afraid to admit that he knew Jesus by that fire the night that Jesus died, Now, showing up with boldness, they were amazed and they recognized them as companions of Jesus. Imagine if Jesus had canceled Peter. How different the story would be. And then Peter, in his own words, in his first letter in the New Testament, the third verse of the first chapter, on account of God's vast mercy, he says, we have been given new birth. You have been born anew into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter knows resurrection matters. So I want to invite you this morning to take a moment and close your eyes. With your eyes closed, I want you to imagine the risen Christ coming to meet you right where you are. For Peter, it was on the shoreline. That was the spot that was familiar to Peter, where Jesus needed to go and encounter him once again. Where would it be for you? Picture that spot right now. Jesus coming to meet you right where you are. And then know this. The one who knows everything about you, who knows your greatest triumphs and your worst moments, that one sees you as someone who is worthy of love and forgiveness and someone that he wants to be a part of his mission. You are of infinite worth. And your life has purpose. Do you love me? He asks. Then trust me. Believe in me. Follow 